very good morning welcome back uh, before i begin the next part of our morning uh, i thought i would introduce you to two colleagues of mine from my firm and uh, they are the financial experts the subject matter expertise or the leadership quality that i was talking about so these are the two finance experts and they would introduce themselves the reason why i brought them in is also very soon uh, i think in january rupali yeah so that is when we are going to educate ourselves on money apart from technology so over to you rupali and pranay thank you ravi so welcome back and uh, i hope that all of you have had a great morning uh, since the start of the day today and uh, it must have been extremely enlightening to hear from ravi so i'm not going to take much of your time but uh, i'm just going to introduce to you what we will be covering for you in the next semester on financial literacy so just to give you an analogy as food shelter and water are the vital elements for anyone to thrive in the environment financial literacy soft skills and technical skills are the three elements that are essential for you to thrive in the workplace and this is exactly and precisely the reason why these three are the foundations on which the college to corporate program is based on uh, so why is financial literacy important for all of you from two standpoints first from the corporate standpoint as you transition from uh, your college and academic life to the corporate environment an awareness of the kind of work yeah, that you do which affects the bottom line of the company is important for you to perform and uh, achieve the company's success an awareness of financial literacy will help you apply financial knowledge and business knowledge to the decisions that you take in your day to day area of work that will ultimately go and impact your own professional success as well as the organizations secondly from your own personal standpoint a knowledge of finance and uh, the various financial <coughs> products and markets is important for you to be able to make sound and informed personal financing and investing decisions so with that specific intent we are going to introduce to you aspects around macroeconomics micro economics uh, how the financial ecosystem works what are the various uh, financial products how do financial markets work what are the various participants and regulatory bodies in the financial ecosystem and then we'll also spend time talking about what is pnl what is balance sheet how does capital budgeting and uh, planning and forecasting work and maybe we'll also offer you some insights into how you can plan your own personal finances see the information around lakshmi is equally important as saraswati so the saraswati is what your college your institution and your professors will impart to you of course that will convert into lakshmi some day very soon for many of you who will enter into corporate social non governmental or whatever the kind of organizations that you would but an understanding of lakshmi and both saraswati then that builds the durga for you so lsd lakshmi saraswati and durga don't get me wrong <laughs> this is the acronym that i know I don't know what LSD do, would you know of. Well, then it looks like everyone would be looking forward to the sessions on Lakshmi. Uh, so just stay tuned uh, for the financial literacy courses coming up in your next semester. And with that, I'll hand it back uh, to Ravi to take on with the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good morning to all of you. Uh, I will just take a few minutes. Uh, before i begin let me comment on what rupali and pranay told you about the financial literacy program she used a term which i am not very sure you are all familiar with she said bottom line now bottom line has various interpretations in uh, human life uh, human life but what she was referring to that if there is a company which earns money then the total money that is earned that is the total revenue is called the top line and the profit that you make after accounting for all expenses and taxes is called the bottom line very obviously unless you increase the top line you cannot increase the bottom line however increasing top line alone does not necessarily mean that bottom line will increase yeah. same thing applies to individuals as well when i earn money through salary or whatever that is my top line then whatever expenses i incur or whatever taxes i pay and whatever savings i do is my bottom line so obviously a individual human endeavor is to enhance both the top line and bottom line as do corporates and i am sure uh, rupali pranay and two of my colleagues uh, 
Professor Varadraj Bapat and, uh, and Professor Nageshwar Rao uh, will be jointly leading you to understanding some of these basic principles. My, the reason for my coming here is twofold. Uh, first of all, I would like to profusely thank Ravi for spending his personal time. As you all would have guessed, he's a very senior official from JP Morgan and to commit himself for spending quality time here, both for recording of videos and for this interaction is very commendable. I would like to personally thank you and thank, thank you, you on behalf of uh, the entire uh, group of students who are attending. The second, as you are aware, this is the last face-to-face -face interaction that we have uh, in the morning in the soft skill program and in the afternoon in the uh, workplace communication program. Uh, as you already know, we are going to launch the financial literacy and technical skill courses. There will be two separate one month long courses which will be conducted next semester. But I have been interacting with a large number of remote centers personally. I had gone to Lucknow, I had gone to Kochi, I had gone to Calcutta, I had gone to Bhopal and talked to people. I will be going to Indore to two remote centers on 9th of uh, November to meet them personally. But the feedback is that this course is extremely important. It is perceived to be very useful by students as well as by teachers. So as I had said, in the subsequent uh, years, we will be running this college to corporate program as a paid service, of course. We are still working out on what should be the modalities and what should be the fees. There has to be a non-trivial, non-zero fees. However, the fees cannot be very large uh, because students have to be able to afford it. Towards this end, and also to get a concrete feedback on the usefulness and effectiveness of the courses that we have run, a survey is being released next week. Uh, please note two things about this survey. Number one, the survey is mandatory. That means unless you fill up the survey, even if you qualify otherwise, you will not be entitled for a certificate. That is typically IIT's way of ensuring that we get the feedback. Even when we collect feedback from students, for our own courses that we offer, that feedback is mandatory. The grades are submitted by the teachers, but they are not given to the students unless students have filled up the feedback. The second and equally important point about this feedback is that the feedback is completely anonymous. We will, of course, know whether you have submitted the feedback or not, but the people who analyze the feedback will never know who has said what. So please rest assured that your identity is well secured, well protected, and it is not revealed to any one of the instructors or in fact to anyone because the mechanism of the survey, of the anonymous survey, only tells us whether somebody has submitted the survey or not. That way we can find out those who have not submitted the survey and therefore we can disqualify them. But who submits what is not known and not connected in our database. So please feel free, give your truthful, frank opinion about all the questions. This is, of course, a slightly elaborate survey. So it will take you about 10, 15 minutes of your precious time. But do spend that time because we need to understand from you at the field level, at your level, what has been the advantage of this program. And if there are any shortcomings, suggestions from you as to how we could improve it. We will use this feedback and design the subsequent offerings later. I'll request all remote centers, if they have any questions to Ravi, please go ahead with that question answer session and make maximum use of the quality time which Ravi has been so graciously spending with us. I can already see one question mark there. And over to you, Ravi. Thank you very much, and sir. And thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for stepping in. Okay, so let's go over to the college which has a question and uh, I think, okay, so we are at IERC, I mean, School of Information Technology, Banipur, North 24 Parganas, West Bengal. I have a question on time management. Time management. Is Pratis principle applicable in real life or is it just a principle? Okay, I will go with my worldly wisdom on this, my friend. I don't know if it is applicable in your life or not. Generally, it is believed that the 80-20 principle or the Pareto principle applies to most of these things in life. For example, I would love to believe 20% of intelligent people drive 
a good number of initiatives that are beneficial to the 80 percent of the populations for example. I mean this is just an example. Another example could be the 20 percent of the population that works in this country and pays taxes for example are beneficial to the rest of the 80 percent of the population. Maybe in our case that 20, 80 might actually become 5 and uh, or maybe 3 and 97 that is a different story. But generally the 20, 80 or 80, 20 principle would ideally apply is generally taken as a principle that works in most of the things in life. Another example you could go by is uh, in organizations as well. If you really look at the kind of jobs and roles that you normally have, it is a pyramidal concept which essentially means a good part of the pyramid at the base are the people who work, work as in deliver the transactions that is what the customers require. So, they are in direct interface with the customers. But when you go up the ladder or the pyramid, you would see only one CEO. The one CEO then works with the next layer of management which is a very small little population. So, you could say from that perspective that the 20 percent of the managerial population really works with the 80 percent of the larger worker population, worker as an employee population, populations are people who deliver services to the customers. So, 80-20 applies there as well. When you look at your own cells, your colleges, institutions, schools, etc., there would always be the 20 percent or maybe 10 percent or maybe 5 percent of the population that really gets the cream and the rest of the population might actually end up with the milk. So, what I mean by that in English is all of you have landed up in your institutions wherever you are because you were the best in your schools, in your colleges. That is the first time when you actually see there has been a normal distribution. The Pareto principle can also be constructed or may be understood from a normal distribution curve. For those of us who understand that, the normal distribution curve essentially means if I were to take this notes back again here, for example. So, if I were to then look at the normal distribution curve, typically in most of the cases, you would find this is how many of the populations distribute themselves. Now, here is the deal 10 percent, 10 percent, 80 percent. Now, what I mean by this is more normally than not, the 10 percent were the laggards, laggards as in people who could not do well in life or who could not do well in your school. They were the people who ended up with maybe less than 35 percent or 40 percent of marks for example and they could not get into institutions like where you have landed up for example. This top 10 percent are the people who have been really good at what they or maybe the best at what they do. Uh, I am just using these words, but please do not read them literally. Or say good. So, you would see that a larger or a maximum population in any given situation is normally in this area, whereas only 10 percent end up being the best and 10 percent you would most normally lose out. Now, that does not mean that this 10 percent will not be successful in life. It is just that given that scenario, given that situation, given that, that stage of life, compared to the rest of the people, these were laggards. And then eventually, they will also find some, something to do for themselves, that is a different story. This 80 percent will ideally in that given situation will continue to do what they do good and they will have a consistent life where they would be good at doing what they do and they do that consistently well. This is typically that population which will soar in life and that is very normal in life and that is the reason this is called normal distribution curve which you might want to like to say the Pareto principle as well. But that is again very situational, every situation will have a different normal distribution curve. So, because you were the best, you landed up in these colleges. Now, the question is 
there are 75 institutions on this call, on this conversation. Out of these 75 institutions, when corporations come to your institutes to select you, obviously all of you will not get selected. Even in your institutions, you will have an 80-20. In each of these institutions put together, you will have an 80-20. So only the 20 will go into the corporations. The 80 may not. In eventually, the 80 will also find themselves elsewhere. But the thing is, the best will get to where they have to get. That applies to all walks of life. And when you get into corporations, then again the 80-20 applies. Only the 20 will get the promotions, the 80 will continue to get the or continue to do the rest of the jobs. So, it applies to every walk of life and I would see 80-20 is a very generally talked about percentage or a ratio distribution. You could end up with a 90-10, you could end up with a 95-5 or a 99-1 as well. That is my short response to your very long question. Next question, next center, let us go to Perumal Manimekalai. College. We 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 back again, lady. Okay. If there is a conflict between top management and a lower level, and being a intermediate persons like a manager, either they has to support for uh, employees or uh, management. Most of our people they will be supporting for a management. And what are the presumptions that we have to tackle? Being at rights that has to be adopted by the leaderships. Can you just list the tactics and uh, some perceptions before that uh, situation occurs? Sure. Okay. Good. Wonderful. I thought I would talk about this. I had this as a part of my notes as well. But I am glad you bring that up, Madhumita. Thank you very much. In organizations, particularly corporate organizations and every other organization, even in your college, in your college, the people who teach you are obviously called teachers, professors or whatever you would want to call them. Even your college as an organization and every organization that we know in life, including kingdoms, empires, social organizations, shops, establishments, family. In every organization, you have what is called power and politics. Do you agree or do you agree? Yes. Even in your family, there is power and politics. Would you agree with that? No, but uh, power, it is okay, fine. So it is some sort of responsibility. Okay. Let me ask you this question then. When your mother has to get something out of your father or maybe when your mother has to get something out of you or your father has to get something out of uh, his wife or you as his daughter, for example, there is a lot of influencing, there is a lot of conversations, there is a lot of bullying, boxing. and. I mean, I'm not saying typically in that sense, but there is a lot of these conflict and conversations that keep happening. Do they or do they not? Absolutely, it happens. The conversations or sometimes. Sure. I'm not saying they will prolong forever, but the thing is, the very fact that conflict exists is also a phenomena in most institutions and organizations, including family. For example, Right now, as I said, shared earlier, I have a 16 year old son and a 14 year old daughter. Now, there is often this conflict between my wife and I, where I believe that my children can become what they want. And studying or scoring marks is not the only thing in life. But my wife would love to believe that scoring marks is important because otherwise you will end up as a nincompoop. Now, a, this is a conflict, this is a live conflict. Now, how do we resolve this conflict? And this is very similar to the kind of conflict that you are talking about in organizations where the top management wants something, the worker population or rather the larger population needs to be convinced about that and you are in the middle, you are the manager for example or how do you um, see yourself as your role for example. Now similar to this conflict situation in the family or maybe in the other institutions for example, in a corporate institution or in an organization. The top management is defining what the objectives of the organization are. For example, the top management says this year, Professor Fatak who was here just now, Dr. Fatak talked about top line and bottom line. 
So the organization at the top decides this year we have to crack 1000 crore revenues, 1000 crore rupees. The bottom says in order to crack those revenues, the top line that is, we need 1000 people. But the top management says, no, I cannot give you 1000 people to crack 1000 crore rupees revenue, I can only give you 500 people to do that. Now the trouble with the management in the middle, the people that you talked about is to really translate that strategy and execute that at the bottom. So you are typically what is called a sandwich layer. Sandwich layer means you have to translate the strategy from the top and get that executed at the bottom. It is not an easy job, it is a very difficult job. And the reason why you would gravitate to believing that the top management is right or you will need to deliver on what the top management is saying is primarily because the business has to exist, the business has to survive. If you do not crack 1000 crore revenues, will these 500 people survive? Will there be business? Will there be a company? So what is the choice that you have? The choice is either you go with the 500 people that you have at the bottom to crack those or to get those 1000 crore revenues or negotiate with the senior management or top management and say, boss, this 500 people cannot deliver it. Maybe 1000 people may not be required, but can we at least have 600 people? I am just giving you a very practical live example that I see in my organization and many other such organizations every day. So if you go with the bottom where everybody is saying we need more people, we need more people, the question is more people means more costs. So you crack those 1000 crore revenues, 1000 rupees, 1000 crore rupees revenues, but if that is resulting in an increased cost for you, then you are not making profits. So as a manager, and that is the reason why I said, do you want to wear, you know, become a superman and uh, wear your cloak at, the, uh, cloak at the back and fly, it is not an easy task to be a manager, it is not an easy task to be a leader at the top as well, by the way. The CEO, I do not know if you have heard this English proverb which says, uneasy rests that throne which has a crown on its head, which essentially means the king or the queen or the person at the top always is very uneasy, it is not easy, it is not an easy thing. In organizations, it is always very difficult to be at the top and we all think, you know, the CEOs lead a very sleepful and a peaceful life. No, it is not true. If something happens to the business, the first person to be sacked, the first person to be, you know, are to be asked to go is the CEO. So the question is, to add to your question, why would the middle management or the managers not do what the top management is asking them to do? For example, I work with a company which has 250,000 people worldwide. 250,000 people, that means 2,50,000 people. 2,50,000 people and everybody had an opinion about how to run the business, <laughs> then we will not be where we are. For example, JP Morgan is a $100 billion top line company. Every year for the last six years, despite economic troubles, etc., etc., scenarios in various parts of the world, we have still been making $100 billion. Now, how are we able to do that? Because there is a CEO at the top, there is an able management at the top, which is defining the strategy for the company. There are middle managers who are executing that strategy. There are people at the bottom who are typically serving the customers so that we make money. And when we make money, there is a whole lot of constituencies that get benefited by that. Number one, it is the employees who get benefited by it because the employees take back bonuses every year. It is the customers who get benefited by it because with the money that we earn, we also innovate. When we put back into the market innovative products, innovative services for the customers, the customers get benefited. The biggest beneficial fishery for any, any business is always the shareholder or the investor, for example. There is a whole lot of investors, shareholders at each of our companies that we operate or that we work in. For example, 
for JP Morgan, we have quite a lot of shareholders that we have and our duty as a business is to be able to return to the shareholder the returns on the investment. How many of us know about, I mean, I know the financial literacy month and the session is going to be very soon, but the question is very simple. Every time you invest in stocks, why are the Indian stock markets going so high and so up and including the rest of the world markets as well? If you follow the financial markets, for example, Dow Jones is for the first time last week crossed 23,000 points on the index. This week, uh, the Sensex crossed 33,000 for the first time. Nifty is doing 10,300 points on the stock exchange. Now, why am I talking about this? I am talking about this is because each of the companies that contribute to the shareholder wealth, shareholder value, employee benefits, employee well-being, etc., etc., are the companies which have a very clear vision. The leadership at the top is able. It is able to really see what is going to be in the future. And these companies have set the strategy so that everybody in the company executes that strategy to the point. Short answer to your long question is, it is important that we have a unified vision in an organization. Whatever the top management decides or deciphers is something that we would all love to follow in the organization because if you have any divergent thought, if you have a thought different than the senior management, you can always voice it, no problem. As long as that thought benefits all these constituencies and communities that I am talking about. Madhumita, back over to you. Being a middle person, uh, unique situations can be adopted as what you have described in this question, sir. So, your question as a person in the middle, you have to adopt to the situation at the top, is that what you are saying? No, no, what, just you have summarized the answer right, sir, with some examples. Yeah. From that, what I got is, middleman being a unique adoption of situations yeah. can be executed to that managers. Yeah. Is it what you are going to convey now? That's correct. So, one of the skills that I wanted to talk to you about is called adaptation. And this is what I had written down this morning as well before I was coming here. So, these are some of the other qualities which we have not talked about until now of a good leader innovation mindset, which means I am thinking every day when I get into work, what are the various different things that I can do today and if I have to do the same things as yesterday, how differently am I going to be doing that? So, the innovation mindset, innovation thinking is a very good uh, skill to have or a quality to have. Then curiosity. In English language, as we know, we describe curiosity as the ability to ask questions, the thirst to know more, acquire more knowledge, how do I challenge myself intellectually. So, how am I always asking these questions? If this is happening, why is this happening? If this has to happen, how can this happen? So, some of those questions that we create in our own mind creates a curious mindset. So, innovation mindset, curiosity mindset and adaptive mindset. So, I am glad you talk about that Madhumita because adaptive mindset essentially means how well am I adapting to the changing situations around me, changing environment around me. And I talked to you about the change management process before we went for the break. So, the question is from the point where I detect changes happening in the market, in the environment, from that point where I say, hey, you know what? This is not happening with me. I deny it. So, it is from the denial mode to anger, to frustration, to bargaining, to acceptance, to moving on. The question is how much time do I end up spending there? The quicker or the faster I am able to move, the faster I am able to adapt to that change. And I do not have to say this. Charles Darwin has said this 500 years before me. Survival of the fittest people who are able to adapt fastest are the people who are able to survive the max. I am sure you all agree with that. So, think about that. So, three things that I have just spoken about and these are important. Innovation mindset, curiosity mindset and ability to adapt fast. 
So these are three things that will always hold us at good qualities of as a leader. I would also like to throw in when I was talking about change, I would like to throw in a term that you would hear very often when you step into organizations. The term is called VUCA, V-U-C-A, V, volatile, U, uncertain, C, complex, and A, ambiguous. Now let me try and explain that in English. Volatile, every day you see change happening in the world, around you, in the larger world, economies, environments, family, institutions, or whatever you think of. These changes, this is volatility, for example, the world is volatile. Every day in the morning when you wake up, you hear something new that could possibly imbalance the way you have thought that the day is going to go for you. In places like Bangalore, for example, you take four hours to reach from your home to your office. That is volatile because the traffic in the city is going from bad to worse. So think about how volatile such situations can be. Uncertain. What is uncertain? What could that mean for us? Not sure. Not sure. I'm not sure. So how the day is going to go. So I wake up in the morning. I want to get to office by 9 o'clock, for example. And then I suddenly discover the roads that I need to take have been dug up. So what do you do? And the trains that I need to take to get to work, uh, there's a motorman strike, for example, and the trains are not moving. So some of these things could derail you. Volatility, uncertainty, complex. And then you have the ambiguous world. Ambiguous world essentially means there's something that is being said, there's exactly something else that's happening. And this is typically very true of, say, the stock markets, for example. I don't know how many of you follow stock markets or maybe any other uncertain uh, or the ambiguous chain that you see. So the question is, do we understand this ambiguity and complexity that's happening around us? And maybe closer home, do we understand our educational system, for example? For each of you who are students, do you understand how complex or maybe how ambiguous our educational system is? We all are very adept at what we call I don't know how many of you have seen Three Idiots, for example, the movie, in which we know all our lives, all of you, for example, have been just writing and writing and writing and reading and reading and reading exams, for example, for exams. How many of us do really acquire the knowledge or education for the sake of acquiring a knowledge or education, for a betterment of our own lives, for example? So think about how this is really... Uh, helping us, uh, helping the rest of the world. So think about how this VUCA world or we use a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world is really going to help and impact the environment around us and the environment around a host of people around us in the environment. Think about that. I, I know we are all young, impressionable minds in the various institutions that we have and I think it would be a good idea for us to uh, Think about what's the kind of impact that we can possibly make positively to the rest of the environment. I know that's a very short answer to your long question. Updating within um, the technologies that we have learned from seeing each the part. So what is the profit and uh, uh, some changes that has been dropped in previous. So before that we have to analyze what has been done occurred in that current scenario. Regarding the changes, if it is not sure, it either in the case of certain, so we can predict what is coming to happen. In case of uncertain, mm. the surety is not given. Mm. Either like finance, NFT, as you said. So. Yeah, so what's your question? The question is, you said as a voluntary. So I'm asking how it regards. Okay, so let me try and get your question. So, as a citizen of this country, how does my voluntary contributions help the environment around me? Is that the question? Yes. yes. Okay, I think whatever yes, we do as citizens of this country, whether paying taxes, for example, or paying um, or voluntarily servicing communities that we live in and work in, all those are going to benefit the rest of the society, not just us. For example, 
if I go and serve in a non-governmental organization during my personal time, that impacts the organization or the larger environment. For example, as Dr. Fardak said just now, I am here today on a Saturday, this is my personal time, I mean, personal time as in we do not work on Saturdays uh, and Sundays in, or I do not in, in my organization for example. But I am here to talk to you folks. So this is uh, something that I am doing voluntarily and I am hoping uh, some of these thoughts that I am sharing with you are going to benefit you. So I think we all do what we do in our own lives and that really benefits a good number of people around us and the environment. So while I talk to you about VUCA, there is one more thing that I would want to leave with you during this conversation today and that is the PESTEL. Now let me explain PESTEL in English to you. It is an acronym and you might want to take notes here. So PESTEL stands for Political, Environmental, Social, Technological, Legal. The first five things that is political, environmental, social, technological and legal. To your earlier question Madhumita, when you are a middle manager or when you are working in organizations, it may be a good idea that you think about all these things that are happening in your environment. While there is a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, there is also a, all the awareness about power and politics in an organization is important for us to understand through the PESTEL acronym. What is the political environment in my organization? What is uh, typically happening in that environment and what is changing, what is shifting, who has got uh, the ability to help me, etc., etc. Technological uh, or social, social changes would essentially mean who are we hiring in the organization from, what communities are we hiring from, which institutions are we hiring from, what skills are they bringing, what is changing in the social landscape, etc. Technological changes, which is increasingly becoming um, a very important thing for us to know as uh, we move into the future. Then you have legal changes that may be happening inside the organization. For example, banks uh, and many other organizations which do business have to operate under a hugely regulatory environment, for example. Regulatory environment means for banks particularly, the regulator in India is Reserve Bank of India. Do you understand what a regulation means? Regulation means the governance. Governance means how should the businesses be done. Everybody cannot do business the way they would want to. There has to be a governing body and that governing body for banks particularly in India is the Reserve Bank of India. For example, in the telecom industry you have Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, TRAI. Then you have in uh, insurance industry, you have IRDA, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority for example. And similarly, uh, in each of the industries, there are regulatory authorities and those help you do business in a very legally and in a regulatory way. So a knowledge and an awareness of the PESTEL is really going to help you in uh, understanding and doing business in a very ethical way. So I think let's move over to another institution and see. Thank you Madhumita for your questions. Those were very thought provoking and very intelligent questions. Thank you very much. So we'll move over to another institution. Okay, so here is a bigger institution and I see a lot of people out there and I see this is the Walchand Institute of Technology Sholapur in Maharashtra and we have a question there. Uh, so my question to you is, that taking a reference, uh, a change comes with adaptability yep. and when we want to bring a change yep. but people are not uh, comfortable with that change, yep. there increases complexity. Yep. So what should be done in that situation? Okay, um, good question. Now the thing is um, adaptability as I had said and as I said, I am not the first one to talk about this. Charles Darwin talked about this almost about 500 years ago. And there's a lot of people who have talked about this after that. But the thing is, uh, it's not very easy to adapt because it tests or it stretches our comfort zone. What happens is I'm doing some things in a specific way and suddenly somebody comes and tells me you cannot be doing that the same way you have to change. You have to change and adapt to a different way of doing things. 
and this keeps happening in our lives quite a few times and every day probably for many of us your question was how do we adapt or how do we what are the qualities that we can possibly think of when we have to adapt or when we think of adapting the first thing that comes to my mind is an ability to be open minded about change uh, and accepting the fact that change is going to happen and i have to be aware of what that change is how is that going to impact me at a personal level and at a maybe in an organizational context how am i going to be professionally impacted by that change for example for many of you in technology uh, institutions you would know what robotics is or artificial intelligence is or internet of things is so some of these terms are very colloquial for many of you when robotics happens what happens is typically good number of jobs or tasks or activities that human beings are doing are going to be done by robots now when that happens what is the change it's going to have on me if i was doing that job and suddenly there is a robot who's going to do that job my job or a part of my job or maybe my full entire full job is taken away now what can i do to be able to foresee that change and that was your question before the change happens what can i possibly do and how can i really ready myself how, how can i prepare myself for that change so here is a, a phenomena or a principle that i am going to leave with you ma'am and i think this has worked for me in life and i would love to believe you are fairly young you may not have seen too much of life uh, or change the way you have possibly or you would otherwise see in the near future but here is what i uh, have seen in my life as what i call the sigmoid curve now this is the third curve that i am presenting to you today i have earlier presented to you the change management process curve then the normal distribution curve now i am presenting to you the sigmoid curve now here is the deal in everything that we know in life there is always what is called a start point a slow slight little dip and then there is a zoom and lady you might want to sit down you may not have to stand all the time and then there is a peak and then there is a slump do you agree or do you agree now the question is even if you don't agree this is the truth it happened with the british empire it happened with the russian empire it happened with the the greek empire the roman empire the mogul empire and every other empire to come in the future it has happened with corporations it has happened with firms it has happened with brands it has happened with people it has happened with careers it has happened with your father it has happened with your mother maybe your siblings and maybe friends around you without the knowledge of your sigmoid curve now what i mean by the sigmoid curve and i'll put this back again here on the frame now in the sigmoid curve typically you start off and when you start off at this phase you think you have you are doing a great job and then you would want to you have your goal set for yourself and a good part of that progress initially may have a slight bit of a dip the dip is primarily because you are still learning and you are not certain whether it's going to work for you but largely you would love to make that happen and then you soar and then you soar and then you soar and then you soar and then you peak and when you peak obviously the next thing is you slump and it's true for everything in life now the question is if you don't want to slump and nobody wants to slump honestly because this is where we all hate the situations here we love the situations because everything is going good, good for us we are being told by everybody around us including our friends and our enemies that we are god's gift to human kind we are the best thing to happen to the world and everything is going good now the question is there is hope if you don't want to slump this the hope is you can evolve another sigmoid curve before you hit the peak and that is here the question then becomes if this is point a and this is point b and this is point c why would you not evolve or another sigmoid curve at point c or point b and why only at a any answers any thoughts in your mind lady 
if I want to uh, evolve a new curve from any of the three points, is it? Yes, the question is why would you evolve the curve only at point A and not at point B or point C? So, a uh, saturation because of the saturation, she, C is at the end point of the curve. Okay. So, what happens here? At and the end point of the curve, you have already slumped. So, what is happening here? Where is your energy? Is it high, low? Point C. It, it is coming to an extension, low. Yes. Again going down. Yeah, it is going down because your energy is down. You have lost a lot in life in terms of maybe money, maybe energy, maybe whatever else. And at point C, it becomes a little difficult for you to change because everything is telling you, hey, you know what, this is not going to happen. Whereas, at point B, you could still change. But what is happening at point B? Why would you not change at point B, which is at the peak? Why would you not change there? When I am on the peak, there is a certain time I am stable. Yes. But after a certain time, again that peak is decreasing to point C. So, there is a possibility of low point again. Sure. No, so, no at the point B, you are very comfortable. Everything is happening good for you. There is nothing that is telling you, no indicator which is telling you that you will go down the slump. But the truth is, if you stayed there, you also might get complacent at point B. What that means is, I am complacent, I am in my comfort zone, everything is convenient and comfortable, I do not want to change. And if you do not want to change, this is typically what is going to happen, you are going to go to point C. Okay. At point A, and if I were to take a green color for example, so here is the deal. At point A, I have all the energy, I know I have not yet peaked, so I am still waiting for the best to happen to me and I have evolved another curve. I have evolved another curve to pick up a new skill, a new knowledge, new way of doing things and I know I can manage that change because I am preparing for the next thing. I have not yet peaked on my current thing, but I am preparing for the next thing, which is always a good thing to do because you never know, after you peak, you always know that there will be a slump, but in the next life or the next curve that you have evolved, there is a possibility of doing new things, a new life and then obviously, you will continue to evolve the subsequent sigmoid curves as you grow into your future. So, my submission here, my, my challenge to each one of us in this room is, look at evolving your sigmoid curves every now and then. Whenever you get the indicators from your environment that the environment is going to change. So, evolve your curve. Whenever you think there is a big change that is going to happen technologically, politically, legally, financially for all that you know, you might want to think about how do I prepare myself by evolving the next curve. But it is not always going to be easy if we go back to the curve because you already know that you are comfortable in your current skills and knowledge. Why would you want to evolve another curve? And this is the most difficult part. This phase where two lives are living together, where one curve is telling me that I have not yet accomplished my peak and another curve is telling me that I am still at the, maybe at the lower, lower part of the curve and then I have to really work it out. So, think about how you would want to prepare yourself for this change and that is the essence of the sigmoid curve. And I am not saying this today in 2017, this is something that you all know. It is just that today you know that it is called a sigmoid curve, each one of you have been living your curves. Many of us who have joined this institution wherever we are, we would have evaluated quite a lot of things before we joined there and maybe we may have gone through this particular trough and then got into the crest. So, think about how you would want to evolve your sigmoid curves at various stages of your lives. To answer your question, short answer to your long question lady. Thank you sir. So, I always say this, your questions are always longer, my answers are always short. Thank you very much. Sir, my question is related to leadership. Yep. Uh, so, uh, sometimes uh, the, there comes a situation that uh, in uh, the members with uh, whom we are uh, working together, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Sometimes it happens that uh, one of the members uh, is doing something good. So uh, every time I have to give a chance uh, to come at front or, or to do something extra. Yep. And uh, because of that, uh, other members, uh, they feel uh, like inferiority complex or uh, like that. So what should we do as a leader in that situation? Okay. What's your name, please? So Shrey Jain. So Shrey, uh, to get back to your question about what if one of my team members performs at a higher level and obviously he or she is doing better than the rest of them, that person deserves more than uh, my praise, my recognition, my rewards, my money. Because at the end of the day, somebody who performs better, you would reward that person with uh, a little more increment maybe or bonus or whatsoever, would you? If yes, you run your so, if you run your own uh, business, for example, and if some yes, people sir. are going to deliver you more revenues or more hard work, you will want to reward them more than the rest of yes, the people. Sir. So yes, sir. there are various mechanisms with which you would obviously reward that person and make that person happy. But then yes, sir. your question is, what of the rest of the individuals? See, again, somebody asked me this yes, question around Pareto principle 80-20. So, in any organization, in any team, you would always have your 80-20. So 20 people will always do better than the rest of the 80%. So, your reward mechanisms, your ability to recognize them, you provide them more. Obviously, if I have say at the end of the year, when I know there are 5 team members in my team, and I have 100 rupees to give them as bonus, for example. Would I give 100 rupees divided by 5, that is 20 rupees to each individual? Would you want to do that? No, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, I wanted to, but uh, sometimes it happens a situation creates that a person is doing better th uh, than others. Then I have to, by, by forcibly or anyhow, I have to do that so that he can be, he is motivated and he is go keep going on like that. Sure. So, that's the reason why I am saying you will never give 20 rupees to everybody. You would probably give yes, 40 sir. rupees to your best performer, you would give 20 yes, rupees sir. to your average performers and maybe 10 rupees to somebody who has not worked well or may, may not yes, have met sir. your expectations or he may not have or she may not have delivered to the achievement yes, of the goals. So obviously in that process, there is somebody who is going to be extremely happy, there is somebody who is going to be extremely sad. Because yes, sir. you have not equally distributed the money, but you have equitably distributed the money. The difference between equal yes. distribution and equitable distribution is, if I were to do an equal distribution, that means I give 20 rupees to everybody. But okay. if I were to do equitable distribution, which means I pay the money or give the person the money according to the equity that person brings to the table, which means the amount of hard work that he puts in, the amount of ingenuity, innovation or various different methods with which that this person uh, you know uh, does uh, the job etc, etc. Those are some of the things that um, we would uh, as business leaders we would like to focus on. Now in this process obviously the people who are not, who have not got the 20 rupees and those who have only got either 20 rupees or 10 rupees will always be sad. Now, that is the reality of life and that is something that you will have to manage through a lot of uh, conversations and motivate them so that the next year or in the future, they will want to uh, really look at better performance and aspire to earn 40 rupees instead of just 10 rupees or 20 rupees. So, the motivation as a leader that you provide them, the influencing for them to perform better, etc., etc., are some things that you would want to do as a leader. You have to do that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, my question is uh, to, uh, related to leadership itself. As we had seen in the morning session, we were taking the examples of family organization. Yep. So, uh, is it important that in the family, we are uh, only giving the leadership quality or referring as a leader to one person because everybody is a leader in itself, I believe. So, we can give an example of a leader according to their roles to anyone. So, is, that, is it that uh, there can be more than one leader if we want to refer? Sure. So, that is the reason why you have what we call the situational leadership, which essentially means in every situation there is a different leader that comes up. For example, 
Uh, of course, the concept of situational leadership is very different when we and, and that is another entire full day that I can spend with you talking about it. But the idea is in the family itself, you would see that there would be a specific situation in which somebody would rise up as a leader. For example, it could be you or it could be your brother, your sister, I do not know how many siblings you might have or maybe some of your cousins or your other relatives, etc. Depending upon the situation, whosoever can best resolve a problem in that situation always becomes the leader and that is also called natural leadership. You may not always think that in every situation, your mother is the only person who is going to have all the solutions or, or your father for that matter. So, likewise you would see in organizations as well. In any given team, you would always have various people who have different levels of thinking. Now, when that happens, you would see that in various situations, various individuals, variety of thinking emerge as leaders. So, from that perspective what happens is you will see that each situation would demand or ask for different sets of skills and whosoever possesses those skills as strengths are the best people suited to that problem resolution in that situation. So, you would experience that when you work in teams in organizations uh, lady sometime in the future, but I am sure you would have seen that in your family as well. And some of the aspects around the way we know leadership today for example, you would see much of the studies around leadership emerged sometime immediately after the World War II. And uh, after the second world war, a good part of the western world particularly America was building up its economy, it was building up the country and you would see a lot of these brands that you know today had started coming up at that time during early 50s for example. Now when you look at some of these situations and when you look at the various geographies in which some of these industries came about, the thinking came about etc. One of the first studies in leadership was taken up by two gentlemen by the name Ken Blanchard and Paul Hershey. Now these two people, the situational leadership that I was talking about a while earlier are the authors of the situational leadership theorem or theory. Now they had started off these studies in uh, corporate America, um, the way we know corporate America at that time, early 1950s. They put everybody together in a room and they asked the people what are the characteristics of a good leader? So, I want some answers here if I were to really look at some of the characteristics that came about and just imagine this was 1950s, early 1950s, the world was just out of the war, out of the woods hopefully to a, a good extent. Then we put some of these people inside a room and asked them what are good qualities or characteristics of a leader? These four characteristics came about and it would amaze you when you hear about this in 2017. Male, tall, white and number four was military orientation. I would not be surprised at that part because the world was just coming out of the war and military orientation or doing things in a very regimented way in a strict process uh, way etc. etc. was one of the four characteristics. But the other three characteristics if you look at it and obviously they had not invited people from the rest of the world, so it was only Americans there. So, and even in that white, tall, male. Now these were the characteristics of leaders 1950s and then when you look back over the last almost 70 odd years, you would now imagine what the world has come to from a uh, leadership standpoint and how diverse leadership is today described as. So, to come back to your question, who emerges as a leader? In your own family, you took an example of how your mother emerges as a leader in some situation. How does your father emerge as a leader in some other situation? It depends entirely on what the situation is and what kind of skills or strengths or mindsets each member of the family brings to the table. For example, in my family, I would love to believe since I am married 20 years, my wife is always the leader in all situations. I am just joking. Okay. So, think about it, you could be a leader yourself depending upon what strengths you bring to the table. Thank you sir for whatever you said, thank you. I do not know if it made sense to you, but uh, this is what I believe. Thank you, thank you very much.
So I am now joined by uh, Dr. Virendra Sethi, my uh, good colleague and friend from uh, the Indian Institute of Technology. So, sir, please welcome. Let us go to Sagar if we can. 1292. I am Himanshu Gupta. Sir, I want to know what is the basic difference between boss and a leadership? Leader and boss, okay. Good question. So, in your life until now, for example, uh, you are what, uh, 20 years of age I would imagine. So, have you had a situation where you had a leader in your life and a boss in your life? The way you see the difference in any of the things that you have experienced? Sir, I have experienced my leadership uh, in various field, in my home and uh, ah. family and in school ah. and sometimes uh, in some function of college. So, I want to know the basic difference in my uh, boss and leader. Okay, so um, on a lighter note, let me ask you, who is the boss in your family amongst your mother and your father and who is the leader? That I don't know, but uh, it's a political, in my family, it's a political uh, question. <laughs> so I hope your mother and father are not watching. No, this. sir. <laughs> no, on a more serious note, so um, see, a leader is somebody who is able to influence you to do what he would like to do or she would like to do. For example, there is an objective or a goal in in, in our life, and probably in your scheme of things. In you are studying in an institution and in your scheme of things, your college or your institution would like to host or would like everybody to ace in your studies for example and on a CGPA you might want to, everybody might have to end up say at around 8 plus or 9 plus or whatsoever. Now that is obviously not possible for everybody to score and there is obviously going to be a normal distribution or a Pareto somebody was talking about. So, 80 percent of the people would normally be between 6 and 8 or 6 and 9 CGPA and somebody will be outside of, some percentage of people will be outside of 9 CGPA and somebody may be below 5 CGPA as well. Now, the question is, in your scheme of things, in your institute where you have your professors, you have your teachers and all, for example, how many of them really motivate you to get to that 9 CGPA, for example? And how many of them coerce you or push you or bully you, for example, that you have to get that 9 CGPA, otherwise you are nothing, for example. So, typically a leader helps, motivates, inspires, a leader influences for you to perform better. A boss gives you a danda all the time to perform better. So, that is typically the way I have experienced the difference between a boss and a leader. You fear a boss, but you respect a leader. If I am told by my boss, you have to do this, come crook by hook, crook whatsoever and you have to do this by tomorrow afternoon or whatsoever and otherwise I will be penalized for example, I may not do it because I may or I may still end up doing it because there is a disincentive or there is something that I am going to fear. But if I do everything that I have to do in my job from a fear perspective, then I do not respect that person as my, as my leader. But if my leader were to tell you, hey Ravi, if you were to do this, there is this incentive for you or there is there's, there's something that is going to come your way which is going to be better for you, I might actually be inspired or motivated to do it. So, the essential difference that I see between a boss and a leader is the leader inspires and motivates you, the boss gets work done out of you, done from you, but more from a fear factor rather than a respect factor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sagar. Sir, one question. Yeah, okay. One more. Sir, if uh, in my society I was a leader, so for example, sir, I was placed as a in company as a leader, means as a boss and I play, the employees treat as me as a leader. But uh, when I went to my home and I say I was a leader, they ask me, I say uh, I was a leader. I say in Hindi, I was a neta. It means that neta. If I say boss, that are the, both a different meaning. So, what is your question? 
So my question is that um, it is a mentality. The leadership is uh, netagiri or um, or something else. Okay. Well, yar ek baat batao. Aap kya political family se aate ho kya? Nee, no, sir. Nee, generally, just just on the lighter note. On on a more serious note, well, netagiri has leadership in it, but all leadership may not be netagiri. Which means, for example, most normally netagiri is associated with politics. Most normally, so the idea is netagiri, the way you describe it, may or may not uh, be the right word to use. And even if it is used, there is nothing wrong with that. But in organizations uh, where everybody works together, everybody uh, contributes to the larger cause and the objectives and the goals of an organization. Netagiri normally would be seen as a negative connotation. It has a negative connotation because ये नेतागिरी कर रहा है, he is not helping the cause of the organization. So the paramount or the first and the most important thing in any organization is the goals and objectives of the organization. And if everybody is contributing to that, it's a good organization. It's a well and it's a well maintained or a well developed or a healthy organization. But if there are people who do the netagiri, for example, the way you describe it, it could be very detrimental to, it could be very, it could be pulling down the organization and the objectives. Then nobody is happy. Neither the CEO is happy, nor the shareholders are happy, nor the customers are happy, nor you as an employee are happy. And eventually, the organization will come down, close down, and you as an employee will not have a job. For example, I'm, I'm just taking a corporation or a corporate organization. So netagiri has both positive and negative correlations, but depends on the situation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think let's come back here to this room and uh, Professor Sethi. You know, we just feels like we started interacting with you yesterday, and uh, we've already had four face-to-face -face sessions in this uh, soft skills module. So I want to take a minute to uh, say thank you. Uh, Thanks to all of you for participating. Okay, uh, we got our fulfillment by interacting with you, and uh, I do want to acknowledge the entire team here, the production team here, the coordinators at all the remote centers, uh, and all the you know we we will never ever know all the work that you, everybody did in the background that actually made it possible. Okay, so um, we, as Professor Fatak had said, this is a pilot run. And uh, I think uh, we have sufficient uh, experience, sufficient feedback, and uh, absolutely no doubt about the fact that you have inspired us that we will put in uh, more efforts to take it to the uh, next level. Okay, so I want to thank you for thank all of you and coordinators. If you were here, you should you know hear a big, big clap from me. Okay, and all of us. Yeah. All right, and uh, thank you to all the participants. I I do want to take. I know it's almost one o'clock, but I do want to take a couple of minutes uh, for you to uh, claim what you have learnt. Okay, uh, I think it's important because we do this in our class all the classes all the time. That at the end of one piece of work, so if it's a one-hour class, we stop after fifty minutes and say, okay, in ten minutes, I want you to think about. What is it that you learnt, and you don't walk out of the classroom without acknowledging your claim of what you learnt? Okay, so uh, I think I want to give you a couple of minutes to talk to each other and go over the entire last few weeks, all the videos you have watched, all the quizzes that you have carried out, and you know the interactions that you have had to take a look at what is it that you claim that you have learnt, that your time was well spent, and that you are walking away. Bigger human being than before you started this entire exercise and this effort. Okay, so please take a minute or so, and then I'll have two interactions, two interactions in which I will ask you to acknowledge what you got out of this entire uh, training module. Okay, so I'll give you a minute. I will be quiet for a minute. Uh, take a minute, talk to your partner, and then I'll come back to you. To so take a minute, talk to your partners, please. All right, Valchan Institute of Technology, Sholapur, right? Yes, say hi, everybody. Just now. 
All right, I request one person to please stand up and uh, share what is it that you claim to have learnt. From this course, a uh, lot of things which, which was not familiar like uh, how should we, uh, we uh, go into GD and uh, communicate with others and that uh, how the whole company works, like uh, how that workplace uh, we should handle out there, how, how should be our attitude towards the all members that we have learned from you. So was it useful for you? Yeah. Okay. So if it was okay. useful, so how many, for how many people at Valchan, people I can see, please raise your hands if it was useful. So here's what I want to say. What I want to say is, thank you for doing the work so that it was useful for you. Thank you very much for doing the work. Okay. Big hand for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Valchan. We'll go to the next center now. Gitanjali, one of you, please share what you came to have learned. Sir, I have learned so much in these two months. I have learned so much also. I'm getting to expose myself to the world as uh, more than the time that I have started this course. And I'm learning so much things like uh, I have got interview skills and I am ready to face anything which comes to me now. Yeah. And I'm confident that I can take any challenge that comes in my way and I can put as my, my maximum efforts to make it possible and that is go through the challenge and solve it. And now I can talk on the stages without fear. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous. I have learned this. I am getting to, uh, in this course I have learned who is me also. That's a thing which has gained much more than anything. Big hand for course. you. Big hand for you. Thank you for doing the work, okay. There are much more things sir, but time is not enough to tell. So uh, how many people in the room, you know, at uh, Gitanjali, how many of you got value, please raise your hand. Okay, so again, I want to use you. Whatever I'm saying to you right now, I'm actually communicating to everybody in all the centers across the country. Okay. Whatever value you got, you put in the work and therefore you generated value. Okay. I want to thank you for doing that. And I want you to know that we appreciate that you have given us an opportunity to interact with you and to be of some service to you. Okay. So thank you very much. And on behalf of Professor Fatak and the entire team over here. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. Okay, pleasure being with you and we hope to see you again sometime. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, sir.